Yeah. So do you need to? Do you need to yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think let's start. So how do I? You don't need my uh, introduction. Sorry. You don't need my introduction. You don't need my introduction. <laughs> oh, you can introduce me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll try to. So, although everyone knows our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Dunbarrow from our School of Advanced Studies, University of London. So, uh, Professor Richard Dunbarrow is um, archaeomusicology who decoded the earliest music like notation we ever known in 1400 BC and also he also decoded the earliest music system from the ancient tablets of in Babylonia. So um, today yeah it'll be great that all of you are coming for Richard's lecture although I may not really kind of do that much. I have very bad sleep and I may present very dreadfully. So bear with me, but I know like Professor Dumbrow will do very good. So what I will do as a strategy is like I'll use a rubber chicken. <laughs> so each time if I feel Richard do a very good job, we'll say bravo! So, <laughs> yeah. so if each time you hear that and you know I'm applause. Yeah, so. Well, that's another <laughs> joke. Thank you for this imaginative introduction, which I I wouldn't expect less from you, Patrick. And your eccentricities. <laughs> Now, my talk will be, is mainly addressed to students, uh, and uh, it, it, it is a lecture about which I will say, never trust everything you see, never, 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 ever. When you see a footnote and refers to your book, don't quote it again, simply have a look at it, and it's, it's not until you have dig to the earliest source possible for the information that you can use it. Uh, 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 secondly, all these footnotes is you simply use what uh, agrees with your uh, uh, thesis, but never those which disagree. So I do, I do not care about these things. What are they for? I mean, most of the time you can search for yourself, but footnotes are only useful when they describe something which is hitherto uh, unknown or uh, appears in the publication which is like me. But if I see, for instance, in, in Hellenic studies of music, Usually, all the references are uh, a little earliest are from the 19th century. And when you find these 19th century in the Loeb collection, which are written in a very, very modern form of classical Greek, and certainly not the Greek of Aristotle or, or others, they, they, you have no sources. You have manuscripts, so and so. Uh, it's extremely rare. As a matter of fact, the oldest manuscript we have dates from 1040 AD. And that's the earliest manuscript for Greek musicology, and nothing before. It was written on the verges of the river Tigris by a certain guy called uh, Calligraphos, which is quite a rather thing <laughs> to have been called a nice, a nice writer. Uh, but uh, it's, we have 170 pages of music theory, but it's medieval material. Okay, then we've got scraps of bits of music here and there, uh, uh, the earliest dated from the 4th century BC. So this is sources, all about sources. Now, in it all started, you see, I've been reminded, I should say this, it all started in 1960. What happened in 1960? Well, it was for the first time that a tablet mentioning musical terms popped up in the University of Philadelphia. Professor Landsberger, uh, who was teaching uh, Assyriology to a young a student called Anne Kilmer, had his drawer there and he opened it, you know, to, oh, listen, uh, my dear, here's a tablet, you know, have a crack at it during the weekend. And Anne Kilmer, as it was done at the time, took the tablet, put it in her pocket, went home. Today you couldn't do that at all. I mean, you would be shot immediately, uh, and perhaps worse. And, and she looked at the tablet, and there was one sign which straightway attracted the attention of the 
young student. And since we've got one cuneiformist here, where is he? What is this? It's like Cantu. Sa. Oh, yeah, it's Sa, yeah. Okay. It's Cantu in, in Hittite. I, I just finished it's not Hittite. My, I, I just finished my Hittite. So. Obi, Old Babylonian. <laughs> okay. okay, okay, yeah, it's Sa. Yeah. Uh, which was in Proto in Proto Sumerian. Uh, it was this, okay. <coughs> and um, it means something to do with music. So this is the, a drum, obviously, and it can be distinguished by certain signs. When the, you have lines like this, it means a string instrument. And when you have sign like this, it means a percussion instrument. In proto we speak about 6,000 years ago stuff. But this is the classical form of sa. Uh, it has anything to do with music. It's it almost a determinative. Now, for the Chinese here, you know what's a determinative because you've got that in Chinese. It's something that you've got in front of a word at the back to signify of what it is made of or whatever. So, this is not a determinative as such because it is pronounced. Normally, a determinative is not pronounced. If you've got gish something, gish aru, uh, the gish is not, or gish, depending on the pronunciation, is not pronounced as aru. It's only written down to signify of what it is made, gish meaning wood. Okay, so this young scholar found a series of sa signs with numbers, and she straight away, because there were only seven numbers written, and because she played the piano when she was about five or six years old, for six months or so, she said, ah, that's music. And it must be a heptatonic scale, because we've got seven degrees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it must be ascending. Here is the text in question. You can see very neatly to the left, or perhaps not that neatly, sa, written here, all the way down, okay. It's a bit difficult. At the beginning, I thought it was, as I said, a cheese grater. But as I've used it as a cheese grater, the curator was not too happy. <laughs> and we decided it was more interesting to take it as a text. It's called CBS 10996 because CBS is the catalogue of Babylonian section, and 10996 is the field number. Now, this bit of tablet is a bit of a mess. It's not very readable. But, uh, just to give it a thing, you see here you have the numbers, three for instance, and so forth. You've got the numbers here, and another three here. I will show you in the hand copy how it goes. So this is how she found that there were seven numbers, therefore seven pictures. So, here is the hand copy. This is how we do it. You do a hand copy of the tablet very carefully, and you do near just on the side or whatever the uh, uh, transliteration of the text. Now look at the beginning lines from one to uh, ten have been reconstructed. Uh, extrapolation made from the pattern which is given in the remaining text. That is, you've got five, two, two, four, six, three, three, five, seven, twelve, four, six. Therefore. And the rest is 1, 5, 7, 5, 2, 6, 1, 6, 3, 7, 2, 7, 4, 1. You can reconstruct what is missing quite easily if you have a bit of an idea of, of codes or patterns and all this. So here's our reconstruction. The characters in, which are not in italics are Sumerian words of which we have not the value in Babylonian. So therefore, Muruktu, we do not know that. Muruktu uh, uh, four indicates the fourth version of the sign. I don't want to go into these details because we've got four ways of writing. And uh, uh, we've got uh, here one five at the beginning. Sa nishturi. Uh, so one five sa string nishturi. We do not know what it means. Uh, two three must be attempted to, to be related with the foot or something, we are not sure. Seven five sa shiru, it's a song. 
two sets that he shall do, it means the, the erect one, the straight one. One set that shall have the third. Three seven shall have a mugu. A mugu would be kind of a flute. And so forth. So the terms have lost their, we have lost the meaning of these terms. I'm sure even at the time the Babylonian scribe wrote these terms, he, he also lost the meaning. These meanings were very ancient and, and uh, probably he didn't know what they actually meant. But what is certain is that we've got one a part of the text which is strictly numeric and the second is with terms. For instance, sa kudmu ou sa five shu, sha kudmu means the prime string, i.e. the foremost string. Sa three uhri, the third string of the there's a mistake here, yeah, sorry, one, uh, five, seven, five, fully. Okay, and these names are the names of uh, the strings of a lyre, which we know from a former tablet. So, because these terms, kudmu, sage, kudmu, eadu, are known in uh, the Sumerian language, we therefore can attest, although this tablet is Neo Babylonian, or a bit, a bit earlier than this, perhaps 800 BC, that the text was known, was copied from a much earlier document, which is probably Sumerian, because we have Sumerian terms. Oh, however, sometimes they used to add Sumerian terms just to make it clever, as we would today in a, in a text. Put Latin, just look how clever I have from Latin quotations. It means I'm an intellectual, and even if I dare, so I will put it in Greek. I'm even more clever, or even Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a bit kind of super clever. Some will try Chinese also. Okay, so look, we have a tablet in which we have indications: one five seven five two six one six three seven. So, what is the meaning of this sequence of numbers? Uh, Kilmer decided straight away that these numbers were, of course, the evidence straight away of a system which was heptatonic, as I've said to you, and that it was ascending. And of course, that it was equal temperament. <laughs> Why not, after all? Because we all sing in equal temperament. Uh, she didn't know much about music at all. And the problem is that her teacher, Bino Lonsberger, knew absolutely nothing about music, although he was an excellent essayologist. And she presented the work to Samuel Noah Kramer, who was a super authority, uh, in, especially with the flawed tablet and other texts, who was the most eminent Sumerologist uh, uh, up to this day. And these two guys have no knowledge about uh, music at all. And they said, if Kilmer, if Anne, find that this is uh, heptatonic ascending, she must be right. And therefore, on the authority of Kramer and Lonsberger, she was put in the press as a leading discovery. <laughs> you know, 3,000 years B BC ago, they had a heptatonic system. Uh, and it was ascending, you know. But this is not enough. You wouldn't know all as, uh, you, as musicologists or music historians or having anything to do with music. That's you, in, in order to prove that, you need more. So, uh, she decided that the Babylonian music system was heptatonic, the system was ascending, the intervals listed were harmonic, they were a tuning system, they were a catalogue of intervals given to composers for their creations. How the hell can you derive this from the tablet in question? You cannot. The interesting thing is that she decided at number three that the intervals listed were harmonic. That is played together. This never happened in the whole history of uh, this. This happens much later. In order to have these uh, intervals played together, we have to wait uh, for the Ecole de Notre Dame, you know, and not before. The vertical reading of music is a thing which doesn't come spontaneously. It is the result of centuries of centuries of, of knowing how things progress horizontally and the relationship between the notes horizontally, which allow for. A superimposition of these systems through different devices, which is going to be heterophony, then uh, uh, polyphony, and then eventually create harmony. So suddenly she erased about 2,000, 3,000 years 
of a music revolution and decided that it was harmonic intervals. Uh, the basis, there is no basis for it. It, it was only an intuition. Now, of course, she continues that this was a tuning system, but, but uh, please tell me in what way what the sequence we have is a tuning system. A tuning system is, uh, uh, is a system by which you've got a series of notes which lead to the creation of a system. Or this is not leading to anything. If I say to you, uh, one five five two two six six three uh, is an ascending system of ascending fourth and ascending uh, fifth and ascending fourth, ascending fifth, ascending fourth. Therefore, yes, we have here a system because the text indicates the construction of the system. Now here are these three: the trio, <laughs> the axis of evil. <laughs> At the top, here is our dear Anne Kilmer contemplating uh, one of the wall lies in Penn Museum in Philadelphia. This is Benno Lanzberger and this is Samuel Noah Kramer. It is strange to see them looking very serious. As a matter of fact, they were quite happy guys. I have photographs of them having drinks in the pub and they are certainly not just looking serious at this, but uh, having good laughs. So, this is to, to show you that sometimes you've got a young scholar who finds something uh, in the text that her two teachers know nothing about what she's found, but they will say, oh, she must be right. Okay, and then what happens is that you have musicologists, Western musicologists, who say, it's impossible to have harmony uh, 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 3,000 years ago. It's impossible. However, if a serious a, a, a scholar found it in a tablet which is Babylonian then it must be true and especially if two eminent assyrologists have accepted that her work was remarkable so this is how we falsely claimed in many encyclopedia and others the new growth uh, the growth uh, it's for them that they had discovered harmony 3,000 years ago and this is absolutely totally wrong now, as I said, none of these scholars knew anything about music, let alone about Western music theory, let alone about Middle Eastern music theory. Nevertheless, Landsberger and Kramer uh, both agreed with Kimber's aforementioned dogmas. Now you see the series of numbers again. So, what does it tell you? Ascending or descending? Firstly, we don't know, because there are no indications as to the, where the system goes. Is it do, re, mi, fa, sol? Or is it do, si, la, sol, fa? With one, five, we don't know. The text doesn't say so. So firstly, we cannot attest that the system is ascending or descending. Okay? Ascending or descending. For the moment, as I said to you, it can be any. Now, there's another thing which I bring, I brought here, is the polarity factor. What is the polarity? It's a term which I brought in musicology to express in ancient systems when there is an ascending and a descending. Uh, uh, in normal musicology, we say it's ascending or descending, but I say it's polarity. Polarity can only apply to melodic intervals and not to harmonic intervals. Okay. It's, it's obvious. Why cannot it be applied to? Because if you've got a harmonic interval, 1 5, which could be called 5 1, it, it's a problem there. Why is it called 5 1? It's that there are two forms in which it can be. Uh, eh? You see? So, so uh, intervals, polarity can only apply to melodic intervals because it's one note before the other and not two notes together. It's quite simple. If therefore you have the first uh, uh, chord here, Mi Si, uh, called 1-5 uh, and after it is called 5-1, uh, they have to be uh, uh, melodic, they can't be harmonic. Okay. What is the reason for 
for this alternation of polarity, because there must be a reason. If it is that, if I tell you about polarity, there must be a, a, a reason for it. The reason is that some of the intervals, this is what is important, needed to be inverted to fit within a Pechtel-Denning span. And this is why we have this odd series of numbers. You see, here is the original numbering, and if you transpose them to a proper order, you have a well-organized system. This is the reason for inversion of polarity. So what we had in the tablet CBS 1996 was a reduction of a system here into a heptatonic system. So, what leads me to prove that this is correct is that, for instance, this interval 5-9 here, called Kabitu, is called the middle interval. And it's just in the middle of the system. So we've got a proof that the, the organization of it was like this, and not like that. So, tablet 1096 must have been uh, a teacher's exercise, a teacher's exercise for the students. Well, now we have the original system of 13 degrees as described here, with intervals. Now you have to adapt it to an instrument with seven strings. And here's the result. So therefore, this tablet is not systemic. This one is. Now, the reason why Kilmer thought that it was harmonic is that because she misinterpreted a conjunction, the conjunction U, in classical, well, it's known through, through about 3,000 years. U means and, and sometimes or, but never above or under, one above or under, never, never. It's one and another one. So therefore, they cannot be together. We have plenty of other terms to say one on top of the other. So if the scribe said U, there's one U5, he meant it. Had he meant that they were one on top of the other, he would have indicated it. I must stress at this point that scribes were extremely meticulous with their work. There was no such thing as a bad scribe. Uh, we have cases of scribes who have been killed because, executed because their work was not satisfactory. And they were absolutely meticulous in copying exactly the things. And if they copied a tablet which had been damaged, they would also indicate on the tablet the damage in question. Uh, they indicated that this part was broken, and they used the pointed end of their stylus to make holes in empty spaces so that nobody could later add anything. So they had to be extremely, strictly meticulous about it. So there's rarely scribal errors in any tablet. It can happen in school tablets, which are lenticular tablets, round tablets, that students had and wrote quickly what the teacher was, was saying. This can happen. But whenever we have a round tablet, lenticular tablet, we know that we can have errors. Uh, the students used to roll a ball of clay quickly and slam it, and we had a lenticular tablet and they started writing. That was the, the final school tablet. Okay, I won't go in the, in the linguistics there because it, there's no point. Now, we have to discuss a few things. We have to discuss the types of intervals. We have to discuss voice of instruments, monophony, interphony, and polyphony. Now, the types of intervals we discussed already can be of three natures. We can have harmonic intervals and melodic intervals and intervals which are filled. It is my uh, contention that the intervals in ancient Babylonia, when they are described, were filled. And we shall see why later. So therefore, when they wrote one, five, actually it is one, two, three, four, five. The same thing as we do when we study our, our intervals as young students. We sing do, re, mi, fa, sol to help us to have the sorrow. So it is, it is the way it is. And in any culture, you'll find that uh, 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 
a child will not spontaneously do one. Uh, those are he will have to do in Vassal or during Vassala or whatever. Um, so we know about the types of intervals. What is unreasonable is to have harmonic intervals 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago and even 1,000 years ago when it starts to appear. <laughs> so types of intervals are okay. Voice and instruments. Now, when we work with the oldest form of theory ever, we have to, we cannot expect to use terms which have developed from later systems. And that's the big problem. So when we speak about monophony, heterophony and polyphony, we must use these terms in function of the oldest form of music. And we must never understand them as what happened later. Obviously. So, what could be described as monophony? It's monodic music, that's quite straightforward. Okay. Uh, heterophony, well, it's basically uh, two instruments playing together, but they have no rules uh, uh, really uh, for uh, you know, respecting any interaction between them. Or if there's an interaction between them, it will be accidental or something will happen. And this will eventually create. A, a polyphony, which has nothing to do with our Western polyphony, of course. Now, iconographic evidence. When we see, for instance, a clay tablet or a seal impression, which shows, as we have uh, on many tablets, a series of instruments, a collection of instruments, there's a harp, there's a flute, there's a drum, there's a lyre, and so forth, does it describe an orchestra? Or does it describe the different instruments in the possession of the owner of the seal? Many have said, oh, we have all these instruments, therefore they had orchestras. Well, no, this is no thinking rationally, because it, it means that we, if we have all these instruments, it means we have the notion of pitch. And this is certainly not uh, uh, the case uh, 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 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Why? Because each instrument is made by a guy and he hasn't got a, a de proper designs. He makes a lie, it depends on, on the wood he has, on the size of the, the height he's got, and so forth. And uh, flutes, well, it depends on the reed he's got. You know, so therefore we cannot have the, uh, the uh, notion of pitch. However, you have different types of big lies. The lies were the archetypical instruments. So we had the bull lies, we had the cow lies, a stag lie, a deer lies, and they had different sizes according to the different animals. So the bull lie was very big, mm -hmm. uh, even up to 1 meter, 82 meters sometimes. It was made with the sound, sound box, it was made from the hide of the animal, raw hide. The strings were made from the guts of the animal. The animal was a, a uh, lateral representation of a bull, and and that was it. And when you have a cow lie, it was the height of a cow for some box, it was the guts of the cow for strings, and it was all we could have of the cow uh, uh, so far. So you can have, you know, you cannot have a notion of pitch there, it's impossible, of common pitch. However, we can estimate the pitch. I've done some work on this having a bull eye and twisting a, a string and tuning it, we know that a string sound is the best at about 80% of its rupture point. So you bring it at this level, ding, 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 and you should obtain a, a, a pitch that was used at that time, or not far away, and, and so forth. And you, uh, this is the way we can make an estimation. And I've tried with different guts, and there's no possibility of having a common uh, uh, pitch. So therefore, it was certainly uh, totally uh, 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 heterophonic if they played together occasionally. Okay, now absolute, well, this is what I said, absolute versus relative, relative pitch. The meaning of polarity, we've debated. The meaning of the conjunction U, we debated this. The nature of the intervals, we've debated it. And the function of thirds, this is the most important. 
In the system, we have noted that there was an alternation of descending fifths and ascending thirds. Okay, so why? I was always puzzled by this, and I will tell you why in a minute. Now, also, I'm sorry, I haven't explained to you why we decided that the system was descending after all. Well, we know this because there's a tablet which is a bit earlier, dating from 1800 BC, called UET 774, uh, in which we have, because of its nature, the evidence that the system was descending full stop. I won't go in the detail of how we could find it. It is straightforward, musicologically speaking, but it would take me about half an hour to explain it to you right now. So take my word for it and have a look at my books, you will find the uh, why. Mm -hmm. So we know that the system is descending. Okay. So we have thirds and we have uh, uh, fifths. So why is it like this? Well, I discovered, well, we come to it a bit later. For the moment, let me see what we have here. Um, ah, yes, the concept of systems, span versus system. How many times have I seen scholars telling me, oh, this line has eight strings on it, therefore it is a heptatonic system plus the octave. I say, how the hell can you say this? <laughs> I mean, it could be anything. The number of strings is not is a span it uh, is not significant of a system. But no, you have this, oh, they add, uh, you know. And anyway, if they also, if they have 11 strings, oh, it's heptatonic, plus one note, plus one note, plus one note, and the octave of the others. So you have this type of, of things. Sometimes you have nine pitches, which represent a system, they are a systemic arrangement. Sometimes it's five, a systemic arrangement. But it doesn't mean that it is not a span, and only a span. So whenever you want to find a system somewhere, you must be sure that there's a construction for the system. Otherwise, you cannot say so. Linearity and cyclicity. Aha, I will tell about it a bit later because I've got a slide on this. Right, now, the term harmony, this is more classical stuff, derives from the Greek, harmonia, meaning joint agreement, concord, from the verb harmonia. Uh, together to join. In ancient Greece, the term defines the combination of contrasted elements, the high and lower note. Nevertheless, it is unclear, you see, even they said the Hellenists, it is unclear whether the simultaneous sounding of notes was part of an ancient Greek musical practice. Harmonia may have merely provided a system of classification of the relationships between different pitches. In the Middle Ages, the term was used to describe two pitches sounding in combination. Aristoxenos would have written how many gap of this, his uh, treatise on this. But what we read here is medieval literature. It's medieval. We have no evidence that it was written uh, 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 BC. We have to be pragmatists. We cannot be. Uh, it's like, like biblical maximalism and biblical minimalism. minimalism. Uh, and uh, actually, most of Hellenists are like biblical maximalism. They believe that everything <laughs> in the global collection about music is of the history. That's it. And they do not uh, uh, try to attempt at uh, finding the sources. Okay, now this is why we have thirds. We have a cyclical system. And we see that on the lines that are, you see on the system, you have line 2 plus 9 six equals 9 9. So it's a third plus a third equals a fifth. So it explains the construction of the fifth. The fifth is indeed made of two thirds. And the system repeats all around in a cyclical manner. So this is the reason for having the thirds placed the way they are. They indicate the construction that a fifth is made up of two conjoined thirds. That's a demonstration. Now, uh, linearism versus cyclicism. When at first you have the description of pitches, like in the text U3011, 
which is a new Babylonian text that uh, uh, has Sumerian origins, they numbered the strings in function of the position on which they were attached on the yoke of a, of a lion. So it gave a linear system. So we felt no, G, A, B, C, E, E, F, G, A. The system of nine pitches in which G is the tonic center. So we have two fifths projected from the central, from the center, from the tonic center, two fourths. Okay. We realize we have tones and semitones. What is the nature, what is the value of the tones and semitones? We know because we have tablets which have expressed these. Uh, uh, mathematically. The mathematics of it, or arithmetics of it, come from a text found in Nippur, which is about 2300 BC, and in which it gives series of numbers which are regular numbers between 36 and 81. And what are regular numbers? They are the multiples of the size of the right angle triangle, except when you've got seven uh, uh, entering in the configuration of this uh, uh, quantification. And 36 to 81 is precisely the uh, uh, quantification of the pitches in question. It's a natural scale. Why? Because regular numbers are simply the quantification of the natural harmonics of a fundamental sound. How the hell did they find this 2300 BC? I do not know. Simply I know that we've got the numbers. And it's not only in one tablet, it's in other tablets, including one in Elam, which is about 2,000 kilometers, 3,000 kilometers further down to the uh, southwest uh, of Iran. So, therefore, we have also the evidence of this quantification on the analysis of frets of uh, Egyptian instruments of the same period, 1500 BC, and also which gave the same quantification. So we can therefore attest that we had a quantification for the pitches, which were from 36 to 81. Now the pitch after before 81 was 80. So we had the ratio of 81 over 80, which is a syntonic comma, which is critically important in musicology, because it's the ratio by which we can uh, um, transform the Pythagorean third into a natural third. So they knew this. They knew the Pythagorean thirds, third, uh, two, th two, 2,000 years before Pythagoras was born. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So what did Pythagoras do when he, was, when he arrived? He was born and he realized, ah, I've got nothing to invent. The Babylonians did it all before me. And it's true because uh, all this came from Babylon. Even the Babylonians, 4,000 years ago, managed to uh, uh, calculate the square root of 2. You know, so puzzling things. So we go back to linearity. We have these, this is a rope, I simply imagine a rope because it's easier to describe, which is the position of the strings on the line. Then they realize that we have a circle, okay? A circle has 360 degrees. Right, splendid. If we take this rope and put it around a circle with seven uh, uh, points, when we have got to have to ground, when the A's and G there are superfluous, therefore they got rid of them. So this is how we transform uh, anatomism, nine pitches, into seven pitches. And this is a first millennium BC uh, uh, invention. But uh, Heptatonism isn't spontaneously arrived, it arrived progressively when we decided to change from linear to cyclical. And this is how it worked. Now, interestingly, because this was set on, on a 360 degrees thing, then what did they do when they realized if I did in 12? And therefore we've got semitones of 30 degrees and tones of 60 degrees. So therefore they invented the equal temperament. But it's a geometric way of inventing equal temperament. 
But the problem is they might have invented it, but they couldn't apply it. Because to apply the equal temperament, you must have a system. And for instance, equal temperament in the West, how do we apply it? Well, we tune the first F and A of, on the piano, uh, which must create beats of 7 beats per second, and the one at the octave is 14 beats and so forth, and we calculate on the beating of thirds that we slightly enlarge in order to generate fifths, which are slightly smaller, and fourths, which are slightly larger. And this is how we can distort the uh, scale to, in order to make it equal temperament. But certainly we haven't found any treatise, uh, Babylonian or, or later, indicating of such a system. It's just a given. Therefore, even if they invented a form of equal temperament, it would have been of no usage for them whatsoever. Some would be tempted to say, oh, they invented equal temperament. Uh, you know, uh, yes, if, if they, they can't use it, was the point. Now, this brings me to this interesting uh, dog biscuit, uh, tablet H6, which dates from about 1400 BC. We heard yesterday the divine Seban Habib singing, singing it in my translation. And this tablet has got at the top, above the two lines, the lyrics, and below the two lines, the music. This is written with Babylonian uh, signs, quite badly written, the scribe of it was not very good. And um, the text is written in the Hurrian language. Now, Hurrian is not a Semitic language, it is an agglutinative language of which we know very little today. There are only a couple of specialists in the world. I'm supposed to be the expert here in the British Museum, and in 25 years I have practiced this function. I never had one question asked. <laughs> Just to show you how popular is here in <laughs> Now, you see that the right part was badly damaged, because it was when the Egyptians destroyed the city of Ugarit, uh, uh, they destroyed the library. This part was really badly burnt, and this part was, thank God, saved and was not uh, fired by the flames. This is almost reduced to, to glass. And uh, this is the, the, uh, the front and the back, okay? And we've got a color from here. This tablet is in Damascus. Uh, no, it's no longer in Damascus. I know where it is, but it should be in Damascus. So, uh, it took me about 20 years to finally uh, read the damaged bits. Not continuously working eight hours per day on it, but uh, at least, you know, working almost every day on it. Now, it has been uh, the... Uh, it has been, is the sound working? Um, yes. Sound working. Yeah. There has been strange interpretation. So the interpretation I'm giving here is that from Anne Kilmer, who said the system is melodic and it is ascending and so forth. So this is her transcription and her interpretation of it. To write something like that. It's something completely unmusical, although we will have another interpretation of the same, which is made more melodic because the singer is good and because they. Okay. No, the English accent in the very old accent. <laughs> now, I want to add 
that on the tablet, there's a colophon. The colophon is the spine. It is where all the indications are given, like on a book. It is written specifically on this tablet. This is a song. It is a song. So it is for one note at a time. It's monotic. A human voice doesn't give two sounds at a time, except for those Tibetan monks who managed to do it with the into harm, uh, 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 harmonics and so forth, but not. And it is a song. The Babylonians were very strict, very accurate in their uh, colophons. If it was meant to be to the accompaniment of a lyre, it would have been written. We have the terms in Babylonian saying, you know, uh, to the, a song to the accompaniment of something. It was not the case. It's a song. It is called a zaruzi. That's the type of song. They indicate in which scale it should be sung. Is the scale of meat kibli, which is not a scale of harmonics. It's, it's a monodic scale, yeah, obviously, which is descending, and they do it ascending, you know. Okay. And, uh, and that's it. We know the name of the scribe who uh, did the tablet, and the name of the composer, Septon Gurria. So the first time ever in the history of world music that we have the name of a composer. Quite extraordinary. 1400 BC. Now, my transcription of the tablet was made according to the development of my theory of ancient Babylonian stuff. I did the transcription without giving anything, you know, any freebie. That is, I only transcribe what is written. No concessions to, uh, to, to uh, uh, you know, oh, something is missing, let's replace it by this and that. No, not at all. And also, um, uh, the rhythm, I, I, I found the rhythm because they, they, it's noted this way. You have a term and you've got numbers after the term. And I found out that the uh, number of the term indicated by how long you should prolong the last note of the interval. For, for instance, if you've got Nishturi 5, or Nishturi 3, for instance, it would be Daga, Daga, 1, 2, 3. If it's Nishturi 2, it was Daga, Daga, 1, 2. And if I do it this way, we realize that each of the six lines of music have exactly 36 beats. So it cannot be accidental. And it also indicates that the first line has 72 bits, beats, and the last line 72, which is twice 36. So this cannot be accidental. It has to be real. Of course, in this part you show before, which is highly damaged, uh, there are signs, numbers, which, which could be disputed. So sometimes I arrive at 34 beats, but because of the damage we can't say exactly. But if most of them are 36 beats, I have to, 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 to say that is a rule. Now, this is my uh, uh, transcription of it, which we arranged with uh, my friend, the musicologist Amin Behum, who is the leading specialist in medieval Arabian music, as I become his wife and also a very distinguished uh, musicologist, and Lara Shokarda, who is a Lebanese woman, but I hoped she had the intonation, the oriental intonation, but sadly she was educated in Italy. <laughs> In, in opera singing, and she sings it, and of course, in Western intonation. And uh, anyway, this is one of our uh, projects with Serma. It's the uh, graphic analysis of the music, and this is what happens. <laughs> It touched the screen, so... <laughs>
So you see, this is an interesting analytical tool which we have developed and um, which is quite easy to handle and, uh, and good because this one can actually analyze any lens of music. So this is quite practical. Now, the version you heard here is the tonal version of what you heard sung by Sevan yesterday. Now, you heard Sevan singing with special intonations, which are dictated by the nature of the text and, and therefore uh, 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 leave them up on the music. This is the tonal, system, tonal one. It means that it is it is uh, really as I, I uh, as I read it. So my 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 uh, understanding is that why they could write down tonal systems, they could not write modal system. So the tonal in antiquity is what you can write down, you can quantify it, and the modal is what you cannot quantify. This is why they gave specific names aside the number of the notes to each interval. Because if you said Nishturi to a, a, a guy three thousand years ago, immediately in his head it would remind him of a series of notes. Exactly like in the Makam system, when you say to an Arab guy, Bayati, immediately he knows what is Bayati. You don't have to give them the notes. So the Bayati, for instance, is the modal form of a series of notes, which would be tonal. So this is the difference between the two. So I think this is how modality came to be. Now, this is absolutely amazing. How it can be copied by certain people. You know, when you've been copied, you know you must be right. <laughs> now, this is a character, a very nasty character, called Belichondej. I was in Damascus and interviewed after a, after a conference. And they said to me, did you hear uh, Alexander's version of the tablet H6? I said, yes, I know, he just stole it from me. He nicked it from me and he played it on the piano and said he discovered it. The next day, in the press in, uh, in Damascus, I was called a dirty Jew <laughs> who decided to steal all the culture of the good uh, 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 people of Damascus. Uh, and, and I said, no, I mean, he stole it from me. Because, you know, he even took the, the mistakes I did at the time, the first time I edited, I published this uh, thing. Finally, uh, there was a discussion between lawyers, and I said, well, it's simple. I take him to court if he doesn't retract immediately all this. And finally he accepted to retract and, and decided that to simply copy it. And then the chief is quite funny because he speaks of the, the tablet and he holds it the, the wrong way around. <laughs> and as a specialist, that was quite funny. So this is his interpretation of my transcription. And I think it's worth listening. Syria is not the not the large go back. the orgasmic version.
This is my transcription of the text. I think we should stop there because... <laughs> now, this is interestingly a version which I did with the University Antonin in Beirut. And that, uh, this is Professor Nida Abu Banad, who is a great specialist uh, in early Syriac music and uh, Aramaic. He's a speaker of Syriac and Aramaic uh, and uh, a specialist in this field. He's a remarkable scholar having both his doctorate from Sorbonne in Paris and, uh, and also in Antony at the University. This is in the Oriental, uh, in the American University of Beirut, in the Assembly Hall. Now, the girl who is singing is blind. So she is singing from a transcription of the text on Braille, I think. So the first time the text is, is translated on a tablet with Braille marks. This is quite amusing too see this. And she's a girl from Ugarit, she's from the place where the tablet was done in Northwest Syria. And it is this time song, this will be of interest for you specifically, because it's used to be having the Zalzalian system, that is the natural uh, 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 settlement. So here is, with an accompaniment which I deplore, but they, they needed to have it to help the singer. <coughs> This, I think, is probably the most authentic uh, interpretation of the text. It's it's very uh, it's rural interpretation. It's an unrefined interpretation from a local girl, and uh, for me, it is probably what is closest. I love Sevan's singing, which is beautiful, and uh, I use her so so many times. But this is interesting in the fact that it is typical of a of Ugarit, the region of Abash in in, uh, in Syria. Now, when in 2011 I first presented this melody to an audience of specialists, Macam specialists, in Damascus, I was a bit scared because I, I was expecting them. They were saying, oh, what is this rubbish? You know, it's nothing to do with us. A totally uh, alien, where did you find it on Mars or some other planet and so forth. And to my astonishment, they started to hum it as it was played electronically by my device. And they started to beat their hands as if this melody was known in their past memories, you know. And after it had been, well, after it finished, they all came to see me marvelous, but you know, you should play this in, in the hijazi and this uh, like this and this. And I did it. And they felt it totally natural. So that was absolutely the consecration. I must be right if they start to hum it and beat it and, and, and do it. So it, it was very interesting. So I worked with these guys and listening to them kept very carefully in what uh, interval, should, uh, what in which mode this interval should be followed by them. Well and so forth. So I listened to the indication. This is what we had in the, the modal uh, uh, transcription that you listened yesterday, sung by Sevan. And of course, the version sung by Sevan is, is spot on. What does it mean? It means that when in the in the Middle East you you write uh, you have a tonal melody, 
when you have these intervals, you are free to improvise on them. When you have da 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 da, you can do da 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 or whatever, which is within the modal thing. And this, this lack like in Arab music, the improvisation is called bagasim, plural of taksim. And this is what's happened. You improvise all the time. But in respecting the original uh, 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 modal value of the interval in which you are. But even you can modify this because you may have a modal structure on descending, which can be different on the ascending. The fifth doesn't exist any longer, the fourth, the just fifth. No, no. You may, you may have a higher fifth, a lower fifth, a higher fourth. So all the Pythagorean system and all this doesn't exist in Oriental music. It only happens when you have, for instance, certain schools in the Middle East, I've heard this in Baghdad or in, in, in Beirut, where they have learned their music from Western uh, books and transliteration for Western books. And then they have adapted it, their music, to Western systems, that is, just based on so forth, octave uh, notion, and they believe in it. I said, no, no, forget about the books. Why do you teach Western music theory? Oh, because the French were there uh, since 47 till now. And we learned from the French, and therefore we applied the, you know, this to the students. I said, forget about it. And now we managed to have a, a big conference in Antonine University a few years ago with the Sorbonne University, where we agreed that the proper teaching of, um, of Macam and other forms of West of uh, Oriental music should be done without anything written down. That is, only the teacher plays something and the student repeats it. But we find that the written uh, intermediary between the playing and the student repeating is a hindrance. So we suppressed it. And effectively, students progress much better with this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lambrou, for your fascinating presentation, and I really enjoy. Although I have to care for so many things and have to look for phones or something, I'm very sorry about that, but I'm not on purpose. So, and because of some reason, because actually, like we uh, prepare some more time for like for some kind of extra question and answers, so actually we could we could postpone anything, so there is no rush. You could ask as many qu uh, questions as you can, and. I, it also reminds me one of my experience that I actually did some kind of like uh, Babylonian Middle Eastern uh, presentation in two conferences. One is in music and another one is in Assyriology or in last month. Actually both of two are just trying because it's my first time for trying this topic and it was a big failure. And the problem comes like the first one is to music. And then I prepare 20 minutes, I have no idea about, like, I just prepare what I know. And then we've come to a conclusion that we uh, spend more than half of the time to discuss where is Babylonia, where is Assyria, and what is Assyriology, why it uh, research ancient Near East, and where is Mesopotamia. So, and then I, I just, you know, take the Google map and then to show here is the Asian city of Ur, here is the Nippur, just like because most of the music students may have like lack of this knowledge, which is, I mean, it is my lack of preparation because I have just no idea, it's really my first time, but yeah, then I know like we as music students, we may talk more. And then the Syrian one is just another way around, so we spend more than half of the time to talk about what is heptatonic system. What is pentatonic and what is tonal and modal? And also, you know, some words like mode, is, there is some other meanings. And so, in music, it's one meaning, and other is another meaning. So, it makes me remember one of the jokes that there is a student who, like, get very confused. He's, he feel confused about his life. So, he, a, he see a course which seems very suitable for him called option and future. 
So he's going to that, he's going to that class and find, oh, what the hell is it economics? So, but, so I think if, I guess, from my previous experience, it's very normal that we have some questions about, you know, kind of a theology fact that we may ask Richard, uh, Professor Dunbar. So, yeah, any questions? Thank you for a lovely talk. I was wondering um, how many musical texts are known to exist and how many have been decoded by you or by others? We have eight principal texts where there's no possible, uh, there's no doubt about what they, they hold on both the uh, Link the philology and, and the musicology of content. The issues which diverge are, are with the two schools, the school of Anne Kilmer, which still claim that there was a heptatonate and harmony and so forth, and my school, which says, um, no, let's be rational, it cannot be. Okay, now aside from this eight texts, we've got about 100 fragments, which are bits of theory. Uh, 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 that we found also in these eight core texts. Now, I'm not including the Hurrian song because it's another thing. Uh, it's written music. We have 20, we have one complete text made of three bits, and we've got fragments of 29 uh, tablets. I have spent almost 30 years trying to, to uh, assemble bits and pieces, but sadly, uh, it's far too fragmentary to, to make anything. But the other the fragments I have agree with the grammar, grammar structure, grammatical structure that we have in, date, in the text H6. Um, we think that a lot of the Babylonian texts were later written in Aramaic and in Syriac. And we indeed have something interesting is that we find in certain churches of North East um, Iraq, or I would say South West, uh, Southeast uh, Turkey, in Mardin notably, and Tur Abdin, we have some monasteries where priests sing in Aramaic, an Aramaic which is about 3,000 years old, that we can date because of the grammar and the everything. So therefore the music, we think, might be also of this period. And it agrees with the structure which I showed you. So therefore, we would have a tr a traces of uh, 3,000 years old music, thanks to these, this tradition. Later, to continue, the, these Babylonian texts, when uh, under Seleucid uh, conquest, became all translated into Greek. Cuneiform language was then unknown by about two centuries AD. And then later philosophers of Islam, such as Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Imrushd, and others, who wrote about music theory, thought that their music was Greek. Because they had got a clue that there was something, that it was actually a translation from the, the Babylonian. It's only now that when we find our texts, that we can say that okay, during the uh, Orientalizing period, when all the Greeks came to Babylon, they learned everything there and brought the knowledge back to, to Greece. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Really, really interesting. Um, I, I have a question. If you, if you could talk a little bit more about the academic environment in those days when uh, we're not talking about this uh, original translation of the tablet that had a lot of um, problems from the point of view of, of music. You mentioned that uh, the musicologists did not know enough about the serology in order to make an, uh, in order to contest the findings. And vice versa, the astrologists that were translating the tablet did not know enough music theory to make. Uh... It, it was a great problem. In the 60s, musicology was a unknown science, really. Uh, in, in, uh, most people who wrote about, about the music of the Assyrian Babylonian Assyrians were people who had a big notion of music, having played the piano. Uh, one other specialist only played the French horn, 
you know, and one day I had a discussion, what qualifies you, uh, you know, to discuss this matter? Oh, I played the French horn when I was uh, at school. I said, oh, well, well done. <laughs> this must be a real, real help. <laughs> and I had to, to create uh, the science of, of agro-musicology by defining things that you must know, the things you shouldn't say at first. You cannot speak about, as I said, epitomism if you haven't got the proof of its construction. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, people, oh, well, it's obvious, it's in that, it's uh, heptatonic, why shouldn't it be? Because so many scholars thought it, that it was natural, because of course, if you take a kid in the street today in London or elsewhere, ask him to sing a scale, he will spontaneously say, do I mean, that's you do, with tones and semitones. A system is totally unnatural, which has been a construction, but because of centuries of its usage, it became natural to most of us. And this is what we are faced with. I even have a very good scholar of a huge reputation who said one day at a conference I held it at Oxford, oh, Richard, you know, I think that we must have in our unconscious the imprint of the dietary scale. I could not answer. I was petrified. And I said, what should you do? Come in suicide or kill him? <laughs> You know, when you are faced with such um, dogmas, subjective dogmas, it, it's very difficult. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell a musicologist who has been trained in Western stuff something which is different. For instance, why should the fifth be always just? They say, why? Why should we have only uh, seven degrees in a, in a, in a scale? In your scale, there's nothing which tells that it should be this way. It's all, it's all, it's all a construct. And uh, and of course, a, a lot has been created uh, after the Crusades when all the manuscripts were nicked from the Middle East, came in, in in the monasteries of the West, and when the original were copied and then destroyed. Why? Because we wanted to adapt the new knowledge that we had from the Middle East and adapted to Christianity, mainly Catholicism. This is why we have terms such as the octave, which is not a musical term. It is a religious term. It means the eighth day after a, 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 a holy festival. But it doesn't mean the notes. It was simply we, 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 we took it as being the octave as we know it today. You know, and there's a lot of um, Catholic uh, uh, meddling in all these matters, which have uh, shaped the music where it is and type of, uh, of say this. And also, there's something interesting. Uh, we speak about colonization and all the lot. Well, Christianity started to spread into Africa, I suppose, 13th, 14th century. And with it, we, we had some, some uh, Gregorian chant, which was given. Uh, 15th, 16th century, more chant given, and then we think about money more than religion with the Industrial Revolution and so forth. So we think of Africa more as, a, as an income, and uh, we forget about liturgical song. Then in the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, we send the first ethnomusicologists, and they arrive in Africa. They say, Oh my God! They sing in the, in the heptatonic system. Unknown that had been teaching this you know, centuries before. And they're absolutely astonished. And I heard this about music in Bali. Oh, no, actually, they have the, the heptatonic scale in them. The, say, what? And they say, an article which I had to review, which I totally destroyed them because of this, because the guy who wrote it said it was, it was, it was heptatonic system that used in Bali. And when it was not exactly this, it is what, it, what they meant, that they couldn't tune their things properly. So we have this arrogance, you know, and this is what I have to fight with. It's very difficult to make, uh, to, to make people understand that a system must not be necessarily ascending, it can also be descending, you know. But this is, this is quite a revolution for many. And I would tell them, look at the, at the pan pipes in, in Romania, for instance, or uh, as well in Central Europe, which is the part of the left, is it the base of the treble? Ah, yes, you're right, the smallest pipe is the, the left. Yes, what does it mean? Ah, yes, it could be descending system, you know. 
and progressively they, they, they try to they start to understand it this way and um, it, it is sometimes extremely difficult I had to have e uh, enormous fights with uh, certain uh, stubborn scholars who thought that everything was Western and you know apart from it nothing is all it was all barbarian stuff you know I had for instance a colleague of mine whom I would not mention uh, by courtesy who, who wrote an article in which he said well you couldn't expect anything civilized from the tribes of Babylon it had to be a, a grotesque music they wouldn't be able to have any sensitivity for anything you know. so when you have this written and published you know that there's a lot of work to do I think this answered partially your question. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Um, but you, I will end up at, at my one. Although, like, I have a question that I created myself because although I'm your student, as a chair, I have to argue with you. Of course, yes. So yes. So yeah. The consequences I, will be all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We will argue and we will have a fight. So my question is. Yeah, because you uh, criticize Kuma's version about her idea about her interpretation, but like as the kind of development of scientific methods. So usually what happens is you have some very insufficient evidence and then you develop a hypothesis. And you find when you find more things like you use it to prove the thing and or you will find more evidences that maybe it will be for like to consolidate your hypothesis or against it, which you know it is a way for this kind of scientific development. So my understanding for Cuba is more like because she is quite a honestly pioneer of Babylonian mythology. So I, I guess or I my idea is she is making the theory or hypothesis by the very limited source or the at that time very limited methodology she had. So but the scientific method that you have a hypothesis is better than nothing. So I think she is doing something progressive. So this is my opinion and just wonder how you feel. Yeah. <coughs> it is better. My, my concept is you're right. Uh, I'm against uh, scholars who take ages before they publish something because they're afraid of getting something wrong. My idea is that when you've got an idea, you publish it immediately, even if it's total nonsense. This is the case of the Kilmer. Because if you publish the nonsense, then somebody can answer to it, like me. And it makes things progress. And therefore, I'm grateful of her for having published all this nonsense. Because otherwise, I wouldn't have, you know. So you, you are right. I'm very grateful to her. Um, the, the only problem, she found the wrong scholars. I remember discussing with Professor Gurney, who was a great, great figure at Oxford. And I used to see him at Oxford and I say, is this way it works? I say, oh yes, Richard, I believe that's the way. And then he called me. At the time, we didn't have email. It was simply snail mail and so forth. He would write to me or phone me and said, Richard, no, I discussed with Anne Kilmer. Now I'm convinced she's right. I said, no, I told you. It doesn't work like this, it doesn't work like that. So there was always this, this question. Of, and it was finally he, uh, he agreed because he discovered it was him who discovered on the tablet U780 that the system was descending. So although he was not sure about my theories, it was in the deciphering of the Marx that he, he could be sure that was right. But it is, it is very difficult. But uh, you say Gilmer is well known. Why? Because she has published on the New Grove. She has published on quite a few important uh, 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 encyclopedias. But if you go in the specialized uh, uh, world of it, musicology, she's not at all considered as serious, neither with musicology nor with Assyriology, where she's taken as a minor Assyriologist. And that's the thing in, in our institutions. Uh, sadly, we, we laugh at her, which is not very uh, pleasant. Uh, now, she is uh, uh, in a uh, retired a thing in Phoenix somewhere in America and, and she appears, you know. Uh, but you see the problem, uh, Kim having written so many articles 
It would have been difficult for her to come back and say, I got it all wrong. So she had to continue to persevere in her views. And, but what is wrong, she had a student called Janet Smith, who wrote to me about 15 years ago, she was doing a PhD, and said to me, oh, I'm a student with Anne Kilmer, Professor Kilmer, but I discovered suddenly that you existed. Well, yes, I do exist. And we exchange ideas and say, how interesting. But this is contrary to what Anne Kilmer told me. I said, yes, but think about it, and so forth. And then I never heard of her again, because obviously Anne Kilmer had interfered. But what is worse, and this is unforgivable, this is why I'm so annoyed at Kilmer's works, is that Kidman published an article in which she blamed her student for all her own mistakes by saying, if it was to be done again, I would not have followed the advice of my student, uh, Janet Smith, and I would have said that this thing was into descent and so forth. So you cannot blame a student. This is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. This is why I'm really angry at her. You know, uh, blame yourself. Be honest. When this happens, you know, it, it's, it's extremely bad. Uh, and, uh, and now she, in her late, one of her latest work, she, she said, oh, there's also this Dunbar, you know, uh, you can read his, his, his work and you make your own opinion about it. So she has admitted that I'm to be read. <laughs> But who cares? I don't care. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Professor Nambro. Thank you so much for this so fascinating present presentation again. And yeah. So I have some small gifts for you. Yeah, for coming. And yeah. So yeah, and also, yeah. This should be also a gift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank yeah. you. Okay, yeah. so let's applause again. So now we have coffee and we actually oh. we have some time so we could postpone a little bit and also thank you for coming and I, I also have some gifts for you and just if you want to know what it is just wait for my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.